friends of mathematics from around the world, a very warm welcome. My name is Kumar Murthy, and I'm the director of the Field Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences. On behalf of the Institute, thank you for joining us at the public opening of the 2020 Fields Medal Symposium. Although we're meeting remotely, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. There are many things that bring people together, shared interests, shared goals and aspirations, shared values, shared joy, and even shared tragedy. What brings us together today? Obviously, it is our shared interest in mathematics, not just as an intellectual pursuit, but as a symbol for the aspirations of the human spirit towards knowledge and towards overcoming obstacles. It's about the creative journey of the human spirit, wanting to peer beyond the known, wanting to push back the limits of our knowledge, of overcoming difficulties and dealing with setbacks, and of ultimately achieving new successes. It's the human story of how mathematics is done, as captured in the achievements of 2018 Fields medalist, Alessio Figali. Alessio was awarded the Fields Medal for his contributions to the theory of optimal transport and its applications in partial differential equations, metric geometry, and probability. Some of you will know what those words mean, and some of you will not. But just as we're able to listen to and enjoy beautiful music without necessarily knowing all the technicalities of the composition and orchestration, we can all share in the delight of Alessio's accomplishments and how he got there. The Fields Medal and the Fields Institute are both named after John Charles Fields, a visionary Canadian academic, who felt that communities that had been driven apart by political and social issues could actually be brought together through mathematics. Nations that had been driven apart could once again learn to cooperate through mathematics. And young people especially would propel this cooperation forward. Both the medal and the institute recognized the importance of young researchers, mathematical scientists who are at an early stage of their scientific career and who show great future promise. Each year, the Fields Institute hosts over 150 workshops, conferences, seminar series, outreach activities, graduate courses, and special lectures. And each year, it draws close to 10,000 participants from around the world. All of this activity would not be possible without our many enthusiastic and generous supporters. The Fields Institute receives generous funding from the province of Ontario, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the National Science Foundation of the United States, and the Simons Foundation. We're also supported by nine principal sponsoring universities across Ontario, 11 affiliate universities, corporate partners, and generous private donors like many of you. We are deeply grateful to all of you for enabling us to do what we love most, the study and communication of mathematics. This year, with the pandemic, our events have shifted online. This is our first year holding the Fields Medal Symposium online. Though we lose the opportunity to interact in person, we can connect with an infinitely wider audience around the world. Consequently, this year's symposium will include speakers in Switzerland, England, France, the United States, and Canada, and will have a truly global audience. We're grateful for the opportunity to reach mathematics enthusiasts the world over. Once again, I thank you for joining us for what is sure to be a wonderful event in celebration of mathematics. We begin our program with a message from Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette, Governor General and Commander-in-Chief of Canada. The Governor General will be followed by His Excellency Claudio Tafuri, the Ambassador of Italy to Canada. Bonjour. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Payette and I am the Governor General of Canada. Greetings to you all attending this year's Fields Medal Symposium, which is being presented virtually for the first time ever. Due to the global pandemic, our world is still battling. In front of you, I know I am preaching to the converted when I'm talking about how important math is and how much fun it is. 
you already know that. But you also know that math has a kind of reputation out there in the general public for being a field that people either hate or find difficult, if not completely incomprehensible. Yet the truth is that everyone uses math every day at the grocery store, for their home finances, or whenever one has to use proportions or count on a certain chemical reaction to occur when baking or cooking something. People read about math every day in the newspapers, in the likes of surveys, studies, percentages, or trends, and they understand it all. So why is math so feared? Outside the circle, of course. I think that perhaps people don't realize that everything is about math. That the way the integrated circuits in their cell phone work, the explanation of why objects heavier than air can fly, and how an eye doctor can come up with the exact right prescription for a patient to see better, that all of this can be described using the one true universal language, the language equally understood by all in the entire world. And this is exactly what we are celebrating today. Math and the talents of those Canadian mathematicians whose contributions and pioneering work have pushed the boundaries of the field. Like this year's symposium's honoree, 2018 Fields medalist, Alessio Figali. Congratulations, sir. Le symposium est non seulement la tribune par excellence pour mettre en valeur les mathématiciens canadiens de talent, mais aussi pour explorer les impacts de travaux comme ceux du lauréat de la médaille Fields de 2018, Alessio Figali. Bravo, monsieur. Et merci à la communauté mathématique internationale de participer en si grand nombre à la toute première édition virtuelle de cet événement. In Canada, we have long relied on science and data to inform our decisions. The COVID-19 pandemic has made that even more clear. Whether you represent government, businesses, or even just a family unit, we all need facts and rigorous analysis and collaboration and information sharing to make better decisions. Les faits et les données, la rigueur et la collaboration sont clés pour nous permettre de prendre de meilleures décisions. Par chance, en science, nous parlons tous la même langue, le langage universel des mathématiques. That unity, that commitment is exactly what we need to tackle global challenges from climate change to pandemics. We also need to encourage brilliant young minds to consider careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Your contributions and their future contributions are vital to solving the most pressing issues impacting our planet. Thank you to all of you within the Canadian and international mathematical community for tuning in and celebrating math proudly and unequivocally. J'espère que vous profiterez des jours à venir pour élargir vos réseaux et pour célébrer nos importantes réalisations en mathématiques et en sciences, peu importe où vous vous trouvez. Bon symposium à tous. Prenez bien soin de vous. Take good care of yourself. Stay healthy. Au revoir. Your Excellency, the Governor General, Director Mathy, Distinguished professors and researchers, dear students, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to speak to you today at the inaugural event of the 2020 Phil's Medal Symposium dedicated to Alessio Figalli and his work. I'm proud and I'm glad that the Phil's Medal was awarded to Alessio Figalli, the second Italian to receive this prestigious prize since Enrico Bombieri in 1974. John Charles Fields created this prize in 1936 at the time of great political turmoil in the world, inspired by the idea that through science you can put countries together. And today, more than ever, as we depend on science to face the extremely complex global issue, his view is not only timely but necessary. Alessio Figalli is a researcher who was entirely educated in Italy, 
at the University of Pisa and at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, under the supervision of internationally well-known professors before arriving at, at the ETH in Zurich. This is a clear sign that mathematics in Italy still has something to say, but in order to have something to say, you must demo, devote yourself to your studies, make sacrifices, and also not neglect the apparently distant discipline of the humanities. Science and culture are in fact founding elements of our civilization, and these elements have enabled us to dialogue and collaborate above and beyond our national borders. It is important that a discipline as fundamental as mathematics remain alive and creative. It is a discipline which seems remote and abstract to many, but which is instead concrete enough to create a universal, universal language and to find solutions to global issues and challenges, such as the pandemics we are facing today. Research must be a strategic objective for an advanced country as it is a key factor in economic development and social progress. And it is of great importance that we work together in order to make sure that your young researchers can realize their aspiration and potential. The fact that the field medals is awarded for exceptional achievements made by promising mathematician under 40 show us how crucial it is to put sufficient trust in the intellectual abilities and the positive energy of the young generation of researchers. And we do need to trust them. Our own future is based on their visionary work, studying theories that have, that have yet to be proven. Let me conclude with, the, with my very best wishes to Alessio Figali for his exceptional career and my congratulations once again on the work and commitment which have earned him this very important distinction. And to you all, I wish a very fruitful symposium and much success in your research. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Governor General, and thank you, Ambassador, for your words of welcome and support and for illustrating the full and meaningful role that mathematics and the Fields Institute play in forming strong international connections and in addressing the global problems that we all face. We now welcome Professor Francesco Maggi of the University of Texas at Austin to introduce Alicia Figali's work and career. Professor Maggi is himself a leading expert in geometric measure theory and the calculus of variations and a collaborator of Figali. Prior to joining UT Austin in 2012, Francesco held appointments in Italy and Germany. Hello, my name is Francesco Maggi and I am professor of mathematics at the University of Texas at Austin. I've been asked to give this introduction to the work of the 2018 uh, Fields Medalist Alessio Figalli for the general public. It's a great pleasure for me because Alessio is both a dear friend and a companion of many mathematical adventures. It is also a great challenge because appreciating Figalli's work requires a certain familiarity with what mathematicians do and why their work is important. It is something the general public is not, is not very much informed about. So while introducing Figali's work, I will also try to talk about the general picture concerning mathematics. Let us start with a bit of context and answer the first question. Where does Figali come from, mathematically speaking? From the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy, or SNS for short. So SNS is a, an elite inst academic institution uh, founded by Napoleon in 1810 on the model of the French École Normale Supérieure, or ENS. Uh, the goal of these superior schools uh, was at the time, and still is, that of giving the most advanced education to the most talented individuals of society, which means that, as a place to go to college, it's a very demanding place, but also a very stimulating place. Interestingly, Figali was admitted to the SNS mathematics program, although he had a high school diploma in humanities, philosophy, history, ancient Greek, Latin, and so on. So not exactly the technical preparation you would hope to have for thriving in such a competitive mathematics program. In this respect, Alessio likes to tell the story of how much he had to work. He never had to work so much his entire life, day and night, to catch up with his peers. Uh, but uh, don't think about this as a to a frantic effort, uh, I'm sure that Alessio already possessed one of his best qualities, that he is an unshakably constructive attitude towards problems, about which we will say much more later on. Uh, 
Figali emerged from SNS as one of the strongest students of his year and immediately moved to the next stop of the process of becoming a mathematician, that is, graduate school. This is where aspiring mathematicians finally get in contact with modern research. Typically, as an undergraduate student, you hardly venture into the mathematics of the 1900s. So this contact with research and modern mathematics is guided by a scientific advisor, who is a sort of mathematical parent to the graduate student. As with biological parents, they can do a lot of damage, but also some good. And their role is definitely really, really important. Why? Because mathematics is fantastically rich of open problems, possible research directions, big questions, and the problem is that not all of them are equally good choices as entry points into research. Uh, why? Because while some directions are ripe of opportunities for interesting discoveries, other directions have been completely exhausted and have little left to offer. So a very old topic beaten to death. <laughs> this is how a dear colleague of mine uh, once described to me a certain research direction that, of course, was not our research direction. So some directions are manifestly very important for one reason or the other, but despite their huge interest, they have seen no progress for decades. Maybe they are about to bloom because someone is about to draw an unexpected connection with another field or is about to introduce a truly original idea. Or maybe things will be stagnant for another couple of decades, maybe a century or two. These are sometimes the time scales of mathematical progress. So when you are a graduate student, your entry point into mathematics is going to play a very important role in your chances of mathematical survival. And when your graduate advisor puts you on a problem, they're making a very consequential choice. What fantastic advisors Figali had? Not one, but two. The first advisor uh, has been Luigi Ambrosio from the Scuola Normale Superiore, and the second advisor, Cédric Villani, Fields Medalist 2010, and at the time, professor at the ENS in Lyon. Uh, what Ambrosio and Villani did, they put Figali on one of the hottest topics of the day, and of today, that is optimal mass transport. So, after the pioneering work of the Nobel Prize in Economics, Leonid Kantorovich, in the 50s, uh, starting from the early 90s, people like Jan Brenier, Robert McCann, who is also co-organizer of this workshop, uh, Craig Evans, Wilfred Gambo, and many others, started realizing a whole array of fundamental connections between optimal mass, tra mass transport and the mathematical theories of fluids, gases, and other dynamical systems, a stream of connections that essentially has kept expanding since then. It was thus a natural choice for Luigi Ambrosio and Cédric Villani, two leading figures themselves in this huge collective effort of understanding the real full scope of optimal mass transport, to put a fantastically promising student like Figali on the topic. They did not get much time to enjoy the role of lucky advisors, however, since Alessio completed graduate school in the ridiculous amount of time of eight months, where one usually takes four or five years to finish graduate school. In any case, Figali's contributions to optimal mass transport started during his graduate studies and continued throughout his career, and have been so important, so consequential, that uh, the citation uh, for his Fields Medal literally says, for his contributions to the theory of optimal mass transport and its applications to partial differential equations, metric geometry, and probability. This would be a great point to start telling you about Figali's research, but before coming to that, I would like to tell you about Figali's mathematical grandparents. On the Italian side, we find the advisor of Luigi Ambrosio, uh, whose name was Ennio De Giorgi, and who has been one of the greatest mathematicians of the 1900s, and also a very interesting figure, who combined an unsurpassed mathematical vision with a very deep insight on the role of mathematics in the sciences and, more generally, in the body of human knowledge. And in case you wonder, De Giorgi passed away in 1996, when Figali was just 12, so they never met. On the French side, we have another heavyweight of mathematics, namely uh, Pierre Louis Lyon. Pierre Louis Lyon was the advisor of Cédric Villani and uh, a 1994 Fields medalist. So, I think this is a very, very interesting example of a direct lineage of Fields medalists. So Lyons, Villani, Figalli, maybe a unicum in the history of the Fields medal, I don't know. I hope I'm not putting too much pressure on Alessio's graduate students to get the fourth one. Coming back to Figalli's career, after graduating from SNS plus ENS, he spent two years in France at top research institutions like the CNRS and the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. 
And then, at the age of 25, uh, he moved to the University of Texas at Austin as an associate professor. He spent there the next seven years, becoming full professor at the record age of 27. He came back to Europe in 2016, joining ETH Zurich, uh, and two years later, at the ripe age of 34, he won the Fields Medal. I was about to say he won his first Fields Medal, because actually, having won one at 34, he will still be less than 40 in 2022, and so he will still be eligible for a second one. Of course, I'm sure the rules don't allow for that, so sorry, Alessio, that's it. I should now introduce what optimal mass transport is about. But I also think you must be curious about how I met Alessio. And this is a good story to tell you, to give you uh, an idea both of the exceptional research qualities of Figalli and about the life of mathematicians. So, where did we meet? Uh, there is this national workshop in Italy on calculus of variations and geometric measure theory. These are the technical arca arcane names of our fields of research. This workshop has a long history. It started in 1990 with the Georgi and his students and has been going on every year since then. It is a very interesting workshop, a mathematical retreat of sorts. Many Italian professors come with their students from all regions of Italy and converge every year to this same hotel near the Dolomites, a beautiful mountain range in the northern part of Italy. So the whole hotel is booked by the conference. Uh, no possible distractions with non-mathematicians. And so, they spend one week, you ask uh, yourself, skiing, hiking, no, talking about mathematics from breakfast time to the wee hours of the night. I know this may sound like a nightmare to you, but this is actually the kind of thing mathematicians love to do. As a young assistant professor back then, I was giving a talk at this national workshop about a recent result I had obtained with Nicola Fusco and Aldo Pratelli about the stability of bubbles. And I mentioned in passing the problem of using optimal mass transport to study the related question of the stability of crystals. But crystals are more difficult than bubbles because bubbles have a lot of symmetries that crystals do not have. So it's really a much harder beast to tame. So I was giving my talk. I was mentioning this optimal mass transport problem when from this crowd of 100 mathematicians, which is not a crowd that makes a typical graduate student confident about asking questions. So from this large crowd, the graduate student Figalli immediately starts asking questions, and very interesting ones. Not the questions you ask to show off that you're able to ask a question or to keep company to the speaker, so to say. These were really the questions of someone who, in that very same moment, had started to think seriously about the problem, about how to solve it, so zero speculation, all action. Immediately after my talk was over, we started discussing in the hotel lobby, and then we work uh, on it for the rest of the workshop, then on the train, coming back home from the workshop, and then over Skype in the subsequent weeks. Uh, we also involved Aldo Pratelli, with whom I work with uh, on the stability of bubbles, because he also had a lot of ideas about this problem. So, and we all three joined our efforts for six months, and six months later, we finally put the last piece of the puzzle. It happened in Edinburgh, past midnight, walking back to the hotel from a pub. So then we could finally take some rest. This is the kind of dedication and enthusiasm that is behind mathematical discoveries. Nothing comes easy for anyone. You have to work hard, but have fun, possibly, in doing that. So coming back to the hotel lobby, I remember one thing about meeting Alessio at the time. I thought the question was very interesting, but also very delicate. I was not sure at all how much it was workable, and I had my doubts about trying. When I started observing this graduate student, who was just very calmly working on the problem, getting one piece of useful information at a time, trying to slowly build the general picture of what a proof of our theorem could have looked like. He was like a detective, cracking a difficult case paying attention to the smallest lead and steadily emerging from the dark. You know that you will need every piece of information, and he was doing this with such a calm, balanced attitude, without any shade of insecurity or of worry about failure or success. I was so fascinated. I have never seen this kind of approach so effective and powerful to a mathematical problem. And definitely I wasn't expecting it from a graduate student. So it was said that genius is wisdom and youth. And when you see somebody so young doing this job so perfectly, then you say, okay, this is really a manif manifestation of true genius. So I hope you have found these stories interesting in giving you some insight about how mathematicians work and maybe why not some inspiration for your own creative work.
Now, I think I cannot wait any longer to tell you about optimal mass transport. Of course, I cannot give you a mathematical lecture on optimal mass transport, but hopefully I can give you a qualitative description, let's say a poetic description of what this is about. So, what is optimal mass transport? It's the art of transporting one distribution of mass into another distribution of mass. In doing that, you pay a price. So, moving a piece of mass from one location to another has a cost that depend, for example, on the distance between two pieces. The closer the pieces, the less the cost. And if you keep track of all the pieces that you're moving, you define what is called a transport map, which brings the first distribution into the second distribution, one piece at a time. And each transport map you define as a cost to be actuated. So optimal mass transport is the art of transporting one distribution of mass into another distribution of mass with a transport map having the cheapest cost. Can such optimal transport maps always be found? How do we construct one? Can we construct more than one? What information is hidden into their structure? It may seem a very abstract question, but that's why and how mathematics works. We do certain abstract things because they go to the heart of the matter, and then they can be used in the most different contexts. You look for simplicity because simplicity is what brings you real descriptive power. So, this was optimal mass transport, but how it is related to crystals? I'm talking about crystals because everyone is familiar with their beautiful shapes, and uh, maybe it happened to you to ask yourself, how are these shapes formed? Why do crystal shapes repeat with such regularity? Crystallographers figured out the reason why in the early 1900s. There is a mathematical relation, a theorem we should say, between the microscopic properties of atomic crystalline lattices and the macroscopic shapes of crystals. So this result is called the Wolf theorem in honor of the German crystallographer who first figured it out. This mathematical theorem, however, is just telling you what is the ideal shape of a crystal, while in nature, in reality, crystals are never formed through an ideal process and are often perturbed by external factors. For example, what happens when an ideal crystal receives a certain amount of energy, E, by heat transfer? The stability question is how much do crystal deviates from their ideal shape, imagine, say, a perfect cube, when they are energized by an amount of energy E. Of course, you can make experiments and measure the answer, but the question is, does the mathematical model behind Wolf theorem agree with experiments? Because if it so does, then I can use the model to make predictions, design devices. But if it does not so, then I have to understand how to change this mathematical model, which correctly predicted the ideal shapes, but failed to describe the energized crystals. So, you want to prove stability in order either to validate the model or to understand its limitations. What we have proved with Figalli and Pratelli is that if you give an ideal crystal an amount of energy, then in average its points are going to move by a distance proportional to the square root of the energy E. These shapes are not arbitrary and the model behind the Wolf theorem is robust. This is our theorem. So, what is the proof and how is it related to optimal mass transport? The idea is to take the energized crystals and consider the optimal transport maps taking them into ideal shapes. Notice that we know nothing about the energized crystals because the Wolf theorem says nothing about them. It is just about ideal crystals. So, in principle, an energized crystal may have a crazy shape with spikes, tentacles, splattered crystals, pieces of crystals all over the place. So we, we are transporting this unknown configuration, in principle very complex, into the ideal configuration of an optimal, with an optimal transport map. The fact that the map is optimal and not arbitrarily chosen should imply that lots of geometric information on the shape of the energized crystals are stored into the map. Can we relate the amount of energy added to how much the optimal transport map is moving mass around? That's what we did. The idea of doing this was, of course, a very natural idea, suggested, for example, in certain works of Robert McCann and Misha Gromov that inspired our efforts. But the problem, of course, was how to make the natural idea work. To do that, you need more ideas, and you want to find them, because this is a bit the point with mathematics. Not always what everyone expects to work 
ends up working as expected. Let me give you two examples. First, Newtonian mechanics was believed to explain the motion of all celestial bodies, until people find out some intrinsic limitations of Newton's theory, which could be surpassed only with general relativity. A less known example, the fluids equations that we use to understand how planes fly are actually compatible as mathematical models with weird motions, where, for example, you have a fluid at rest, like water in a glass, and then it starts moving without the intervention of external forces, and then slowly comes back to rest. So these are, there are many lessons about nature to be learned behind mathematical phenomena, and lessons about mathematics to be learned taking inspiration from natural phenomena. Coming back to Figali's work, let me give you other examples of it, in addition to the stability theorem for crystals. Another example of Figali's work is the work on the semi-geostrophic equations. These are the equations used to model winds on Earth and are one of the fundamental mathematical tools used in meteorology. Alessio, in joint works with Guido de Filippis first, and then also with Luigi Ambrosio, and with their jointly advised graduate students, uh, Maria Colombo, who were both speakers this morning at the workshop, has successfully bridged the mathematical theory of optimal mass tra transport into the semi-geostrophic equations, something that people, meteorologists and mathematicians, have suspected could have been done for decades and wanted to do because it would have allowed for a better computational understanding of the semi-geostrophic equations. So I cannot really tell you about uh, their work, their mathematical work, but what is computational understanding of the semi-geostrophic equations? Why do we need it? Computational understanding means how do you speak with your computer about the equation? How much should you trust what your computer is telling you? For example, for which time span will the simulation of the computer be accurate? You know, you can ask your computer what the weather will be in one month. And if it is a sufficiently powerful computer, it will give you an answer with some hours of computations. But the answer will be wrong. The semi-geostrophic equations are so sensitive that there are theoretical limits to how far in the future you can go before the accumulation of small initial errors, both in the data collection and in the numerical approximation will build up into macroscopic errors. So it is important to understand the mathematics of these equations in order to have the best possible control on how we instruct our computers and for understanding what are the limits of what they can tell us. So this is why these works of Figali and collaborators on the semi-geostrophic equations were so important for applications. From the point of view of mathematics, they have a huge value in their ingenuity, inventiveness, and intellectual depth. Mathematicians do not really care about computing future weather. As much as the average folk, they just listen to the weatherman. But at times, they give the weatherman a helping hand. So another area where Figali has given major contributions is the theory of free boundaries. This is a mathematical theory of evolving, moving interfacings arising in biology, geology, physics. A typical example is ice melting. You can imagine having a column of ice that is melting. At a certain point, two columns of ice separate at the tip and detach. And this evolving surface with its singularities is what you call a free boundary. The modern theory of free boundaries has been created essentially in the 80s by Luis Caffarelli, who is also co-organizer of the workshop and the person that attracted uh, Figali to Austin in the first place. And then Figali attracted me to Austin. So Caffarelli made many groundbreaking discoveries about free boundaries, but also left open some very interesting questions that have been open for 30 years. These questions have been solved in a whole series of spectacular papers written by Figalli in collaboration with Xavi Cabré, Joachim Serra, Xavi Ross Oton, and many others, where they put this theory in some of its main aspects, at least, into final form, giving us a sharp, complete mathematical understanding of these models. As a final example, I will talk about, very quickly and very superficially, uh, of a joint work of Figalli with Alice Gurney. So this work has given long sought answers about the following fundamental questions. How is randomness reflected in the distribution of the energy levels of a system? So this sounds a very esoteric question, even more than the problems I have talked so far 
which at least pertain winds, melting ice, and crystals. The reason for this abstraction is that this same question talks about many, many different situations. It arises in largely unrelated fields like quantum mechanics, finance, telecommunications, where the relations between abstract concepts like randomness and energy level distributions plays a crucial role, taking different names, of course. I will stop here with my list of examples. The point is that there are too many interesting problems where Figali has given major contributions together with his collaborators and students and was vast majority I've not even mentioned in this short introduction for the general public. And indeed, we are having an entire workshop at the Fields Institute this week, although in virtual form, just to discuss the latest developments around Figali's work. But let me stress to close what is a common trait of all these examples. It is the research of a full theoretical understanding of mathematical models used in the sciences. Why is this relevant? It is relevant because science is not only made by experimental work and collection of experimental data. Experimental knowledge alone has some intrinsic limitations, like it happens with the knowledge of the artisan. At the end of the day, you will have to construct something to see if and how that something works. While theoretical knowledge can tell you how something will work without the need of constructing it for real, but just by constructing it, so to say, in the laboratory of your mind, it gives you predictions with margins of error, of course, and can inform you about decisions about what is worth trying to construct for real. Mathematics is the place where you can do such thought experiments. Actually, Mathematics, with its descriptive power, has also broken the barriers of what is accessible to experience itself. No one can experience atoms or galaxies, but the mathematics behind quantum mechanics and general relativity is needed to construct the tools and experimental machinery that gives us information about atoms and galaxies, and to interpret the results of these experiments. Actually, without modern mathematics, it would be impossible to even conceive these experiments and the machinery needed to perform them. I think it is important to realize, in order to appreciate the importance of the work of someone like Figalli, that mathematics is a very pervasive creative force in the sciences. Figalli's work is a monumental contribution to this scientific collective effort aimed at understanding mathematical models and at developing new ones. So, I hope you have enjoyed this talk. I have tried my best to introduce you to some aspects of the work of Alessio Figalli, but also to tell you something about the work of mathematicians and about the extreme vitality and relevance of mathematics for the sciences and for our technologically complex societies. Let me congratulate again Alessio for his Fields Medal and let me thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francesco, for that wonderful exposition. It is time now to welcome our special honoree this evening, Alicia Figali. He will be engaged in conversation by Hannah Fry. Hannah is a well-known broadcast personality and public speaker. She's also a professor of mathematics at University College London. I can't imagine a better person to help us to understand Alicia's perspective on mathematics and on life. Please join me in welcoming Alicia and Hannah for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thank you very much, Kima. Well, I am joined this evening by the man of the hour, Alessio himself, uh, as well as many of you from around the world. I've been keeping my eyes on the uh, the YouTube chats that's coming up. And uh, people have been saying hello from Mumbai, uh, from Vietnam. There was even someone saying hello from the cow pastures of uh, Vermont. Uh, didn't know that cow pastures of Vermont had particularly good Wi-Fi, but there we go. Uh, you learn every day. Um, now, as we go through this conversation with Alessio, please do send in your questions. Uh, they will get through to us and I can ask Alessio on your behalf. Um, but Alicia, I know everyone is very eager to hear a lot of your thoughts this evening on a number of things. Uh, but I wanted, if I may, to just start at the very beginning, if that's all right with you. And I wondered if you can remember the very first piece of mathematics that you came across that you were really amazed by. Oh, well, when I was a student, actually, you know, um, I started university. I didn't know that much math. I never studied too much mathematics before. So I was immediately fascinated by this new world. 
And then uh, growing, you know, already second, third year, I started to see more advanced stuff. I remember, you know, this kind of theorems in functional analysis where you have existence of solutions by these abstract methods. And then uh, I also remember, and maybe it's nice to cite, to cite this because uh, Cedric Villani will be there later, this theorem uh, uh, of, um, of, of the proof of Sobolev inequality via optimal transport that then is also inspired a lot my research. Uh, that uh, Villani did with some co-authors. Uh, I was a third year student and I was just fascinated by how mathematics was so interconnected. So the more I saw, the, the more I got excited. <laughs> it's enough, I mean, that's, that's in some ways quite late. I mean, you were, you were a bit of a late starter when it came to mathematics, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I started, uh, I mean, as maybe you have seen in the video, right? So I, as a student, I was st studying classics until 18. So it was just around 16 that I, I started to be exposed to math because of the math Olympiads. I mean, I, um, I found these new different problems, different from what you see at school. And what I liked was the, the challenge. Uh, I've never been a competitive person with the others, but I was competitive with myself. And so I like the challenge, just put myself on it and try to do whatever I could. And that was the beginning of being exposed to failure also, because many had to do them, especially at the beginning. But the more you try, the more with time, you know, you start to get some satisfactions and then you get excited. So yeah, I start late, but uh, probably it was a good thing. Sometimes, you know, uh, students are get scared by mathematics during the, the course of the studies. Uh, I didn't have this put, uh, too much exposure to mathematics, so in the end I couldn't hate it either. <laughs> so it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Just right in at the deep end, Lesley, like that. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Um, as you were doing those Olympiads, I mean, I know you, you spoke there about um, failure, but did you have success too at that time? Did you, how did you do in the Olympiads? Well, I mean, uh, I would say very well for, for what I would have expected at the beginning, in the sense, you know, I started from the level of this high school. It was really my first time and I made it to the level. I think the, I participated the last two years of high school. The, and the, the first time I went to the national, I made it to the first, uh, I think 25, uh, which I found amazing. I mean, uh, I've already, you know. And then the second year, uh, I made it a bit better. And then I made it to the uh, team uh, that was, there was a, let's say a selection that would have been trained for the international competition. Uh, so I made it to this group of people that uh, among among which then you had to select the top six. So there was another test and uh, I made it seventh actually. So I didn't went to the IMO, to the International Mathematical Olympics because of alpha point uh, that made me arrive seventh. Uh, that's okay. You know, of course, at that moment I was a bit sad, but, uh, you know, that's fine. You know. Well, where are their fields medals? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, you know, no one told me back then, right? So <laughs> at that moment, I only knew that I didn't make the demo. But well, it was okay, you know. But even at that point, okay, so when you're in, doing these impairs, you're 17 years old or so about this, at this point. Yeah, did 17 you, you have, When did you decide that you were going to do maths at university where you were going to properly take it up? Oh, I didn't know until the last day almost. I remember uh, already during summer, I decided to participate to the um, uh, ex exam examination to enter the uh, Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa. But uh, still at that moment, I was doubting a lot. I mean, I, I participated to that uh, mission, but I also participated to uh, an admission for an engineering school in Pisa, in Sant'Anna. So I didn't know. I was like, maybe I do math, maybe I do physics, maybe I do engineering. I mean, I had no clue. Uh, and uh, maybe the, the kind of Eureka was when I got admitted to Scuola Normale, but not of any reason, but I just remember how happy I was when I saw my name in the list of the students selected. Uh, I don't know, I, I didn't expect that. To be honest, I, I didn't expect to make it. And I was so happy at that moment, I thought, okay, let's do it. I go for math, even, you know, uh, but it was also a bit irrational at that moment, but it was a good, irrational moment. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that is an unusual story in a lot of ways to have that last minute, that last minute decision. Um, I mean, I think 
lots of people who end up going on to do math PhDs, they know a bit before. They have like a number of mathematical heroes that they've read about that have inspired them along the way. Uh, did you have that too as you were growing up? No, mathematical heroes I never read. I mean, uh, I never considered mathematics. In fact, I didn't know. Maybe I, since I never thought much about mathematics as a job, I didn't even study the life of mathematicians. And to be honest, I didn't even realize that mathematician existed that much. I mean, I thought mathematics was still an old subject that stuck many, uh, you know, decades ago. And um, I mean, that was, you know, ignorance on my side. But um, yeah, um, it was really with the Math Olympiads that I met students who started to say, oh, I want to do math in, at the university and then maybe become a mathematician. I was like, what? You can do a mathematician? I mean, like, uh, it was a late discovery and uh, uh, it was a nice discovery. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, in reality, I never planned my life. I mean, uh, I started mathematics and I didn't think I would go to graduate school or anything else. I just thought, now I do math. I do my undergraduate degree. There is first, you know, you do three years, bachelor. And then when I did the bachelor, of course, it was natural to do the master. And when I finished the master, I just wasn't natural to continue. I, I, but without really planning, uh, I don't know. Uh, I never planned too much. Things came and uh, in a good way. But uh, I just was transformed. I liked what I was doing. Just went on. Right. So you didn't necessarily choose mathematics. You just never gave it up. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. At the, well, let's say I made that choice at the very moment, and then I never yeah. gave up on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So during your university days, then, when you were doing your training, were there areas that you felt you were weaker at during your training? Definitely. Yeah. I mean. Uh, um, I switched, right? At the first year, I thought I was better in algebra than analysis. So I thought I would never do analysis because I'm really not good at it. And then uh, second year, then I started uh, to perform better in analysis. I think the reason was that I felt stupid. I trained a lot in analysis, so analysis, and then made me stronger when I reached the second year. And uh, But then going on, I felt like, for instance, I remember exams like in algebra, like algebra geometry where, uh, um, you know, you had, and there were some, some proofs, some arguments where people say, oh, yeah, you prove this by taking this polynomial, and then when this polynomial vanishes, uh, is at zero set, and with this, we prove the theorem. And I just felt like a miracle. How did they come up with that? And of course, you know, there is never a miracle in mathematics. It's all based on uh, hard work first, and this hard work builds intuition, and then the intuition, you construct proofs. So it's not that you wake up at night and, uh, you know, some divine illumination tells you how to prove a theorem. But uh, I'm, let's say for some areas of mathematics, it felt like that to me. And that's why maybe I avoided them because uh, I needed to, to feel the intuition, to touch what I was doing. And uh, for me, it was more natural than the analytic path. And that's why I chose my field. So th that's an interesting question, actually, about choosing your field. Did you feel like choosing choosing the, the field of optimal transport was was an active choice, or was it about the people that were surrounding you, the, the collaborations that were, were available? Yeah, no, it wasn't an active choice. I think uh, in, as every, as you know, all the time in life, you also have to be lucky. So you know, I was in peace at that moment, and at that moment, optimal transport was a very hot topic, and there were many. PhD student who were working on it. So when I was a bachelor student, I could see some of the PhD students working on this topic and they will maybe share this uh, at the canteen where we were having lunch or dinner. And they would say, oh yeah, I'm working on this problem. It's so cool. In particular, there was one of former student of Luigi Ambrosio who was slightly older than me, Nicola Gigli. And one day he just told me this in front of the canteen. He was smoking a cigarette and he told me what he was doing during his PhD. And, uh, and I found it cool. So I thought, oh, this is a nice problem. And then, kind of coincidence, a few months later, it was when I was going for a, as an exchange student to Lyon. So, uh, you know, in Lyon, then uh, the Col Normal, uh, there were quite a few people working on optimal transport. So, notably Cedric Villani, uh, that then later became my PhD advisor, and also Albert Fatih, who was my a professor and my office neighbor in the Ecole Normale. And so I started to work on optimal transport a bit by coincidence because I heard about it, I found it cool, I read a bit uh, like some lecture notes. 
so uh, yeah, I think it was the right moment. I was at the right moment at the right place. Uh, that's also a fact. Uh, I think the, the important thing, I think, you know, um, fortune, so you need to be lucky in life, but you also have to help it. So uh, on one hand, I was lucky that I was I found myself in this right moment, right place. On the other hand, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, I had all the training needed to work on this problem, that was what also allowed me to quickly uh, start to work on it. So the two things went together and uh, that's how it happened. And during your PhD, how was it having two supervisors that were in different countries then? I mean, how did that work? Oh, for me, it worked super well because they were uh, exceptionally, you know, flexible with me. So uh, I was essentially commuting between uh, Lyon and Pisa. Uh, maybe the, I was just unlucky in the sense that there was no easy way to commute. Let's say it was not super well connected. Um, but, you know, I was spent maybe two, three months in Pisa, then two, three months in Lyon. And uh, then people, of course, start to make the joke that consider my PhD was not that long. <laughs> I didn't well, have to do for that. To say. <laughs> uh, I didn't have to do that that much. But essentially, when I was in uh, Pisa, I would meet with uh, Luigi I'm, I'm also for, I mean, very intensely. I mean, we will meet even six times a week uh, because we work on a project and we'll meet every day. And then when I was in Lyon, I also could meet Cedric essentially every day. You know, he was at the office. And I still remember that he was very busy, Cedric. So maybe some days he didn't have time for me. And then he would come to my office when I was going back home. He would knock at my door and he would say, I'm going back home. Walk with me up to the subway station so that we can discuss math. So our, we had a lot of discussions between the office and the subway station uh, to try to, to to try to discuss my math problems. How long <laughs> that was, between the two? Oh, it wasn't that long, probably 10, 10 15 minutes. It wasn't long, but it was uh, very intense, you know, like 15 minutes, like, blah, 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 and, you know, Cedric also is very fast. So we will, I will tell him briefly what I was doing, say, oh, yeah, try this, this, and this, and uh, you, tomorrow you tell me how it goes. You know? uh, but okay, it worked uh, very nicely for me. I was very lucky that they were both, uh, you know, uh, very supportive. They gave me beautiful problems, and uh, also they made it very easy for me to to travel and to discuss with both advisors. And at the same time, also they gave me the flexibility to to think about other problems, like uh, Francesco mentioned this problem about um, superimetric optical transport and crystals. That's something I was doing also during my PhD. And I just told them, oh, I'm, you know, I'm chatting on Skype with Francesco Maggi uh, about some problem. And they didn't even ask, uh, you know, oh, okay, what are you doing? They say, oh, yeah, Francesco is a great guy. Just work with him. It's fine. <laughs> so, uh, and I uh, said, so, yeah, then when I was going back to Pisa, I would meet also with uh, Aldo Pratelli was there. So, yeah, it just worked fine, but I think uh, I was very lucky, and also the the fact that Luigi and Cedric uh, were also so good friends also helped uh, in all the relation. It was I cool. mean, I think it, everything came together quite well, which it must have done because uh, one of the questions that we had in on YouTube was, "How is it possible for anyone to complete a PhD in eight months?" Tell us. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Let's. Uh, there is a. a let's say there is a point right so i started in reality i started doing research during my master right so when i was uh, at, at the Col normal at the last year of my master um i was a visiting student and uh, i was chatting with albert fati and cedric villanider and they already gave me problems to work on and then this was for the first semester of my master and then when i went back back to pisa uh, Luigi Ambrosio told me, oh, yeah, yeah, let's start to discuss also this problem. And this was before I started my PhD. So reality, when I started my PhD, I had already worked on research for one year. And uh, so that was November uh, 20, 2006. And uh, I mean, the fact that I finished the PhD also is not really my choice. And uh, in the sense that, you know, it was a professor who, at, uh, a French professor one day who told me, oh, why don't you apply for a CNRS position? And this was in December. So one month after I started my PhD. And I was like, what are you talking about? I mean, I started my PhD one month ago. I can apply for a CNRS position. And he told me, oh, no, no, but don't worry. You have zero chance of succeeding. That's, a, that's, that's clear. 
but I think it's just good because maybe in a couple of years, because people will have seen you, see your CV, maybe you have more chances. I say, okay, cool, why not? So, I, you know, I just submit application. It didn't cost me anything to do it. And, and also Cedric and Luigi, they were like, yeah, yeah, it's good that you try. You have zero chances, but whatever, right? And then, uh, you know, at the, at the moment of the interview, it was five months later. And uh, also I arrived there, I had the interview, and I still remember the president of the CNRS committee who looked at me and says, why did you apply? <laughs> this was the question. <laughs> and my answer was, like, well, to be honest, they told me to. I mean, I didn't really think much. They told me to, I said, yeah, why not? And so they asked me, okay, what are you doing? And then I told them exactly about the problem I was working with Francesco and Aldo about these crystals. I said, yeah, we can already prove this almost the optimal result. I'm sure we can do the optimal one. I don't know, maybe I did a good interview, whatever. And, uh, you know, people behind me, they supported me. I'm sure, you know, Cedric uh, and Luigi and many others supported me in that moment. And then the committee gave me the position. So the point was that, you know, I had a CNRS position. This was end of April. And I started my PhD in November. So it was reality six months. And then I had no choice, right? I had to start a new job as a CNRS. So I say, okay, now I, I need to write a PhD thesis. So let's collect everything I've done until now and let's write it down. So, you know, the story is different, right? It's not that I, I didn't plan to make it so short. <laughs> I, I, <didn't> plan it. <laughs> I can imagine that was a stressful couple of months at the end there. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, about something that um, has been briefly mentioned already. Uh, this idea that um, one of the results that was mentioned for the Fields Medal that you came up with after a few beers in during a night out after a conference. Is that is that an accurate depiction of what happened? Definitely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, also Francesco mentioned that in his video. So you can see that, you know, we are on the same page and I'm not... <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, yeah, we were in Edinburgh. There was a beautiful conference there, and it was the three of us, me, Francesco, and Aldo. And we went in the evening for a beer, and I still remember very well the moment, right? Walking home, we were just walking on the street, and at some moment it was like, wait, why don't we do that in the proof? And it was funny because we didn't speak about math the whole evening. I, I, I don't have this memory. I think we have been doing math very intensively during the day, uh, and of course, all the mounts before. And this is something fun about how the brain works, right? So we spent so much time in front of blackboards, uh, doing Skype, in front of uh, you know a piece of paper, doing computations, and we got stuck all the time. And then the key idea just came at some moment working, which means that in reality the brain keeps you know working on the background. So uh, it's true that at some moment you can have this eureka moment, but the reality. I think is that you know it becomes because you spent a lot of time before thinking deeply about the problem. But yes, the key idea was just there, and uh, it was funny. I remember uh, uh, we arrived uh, at the, our hotel in the lobby, and we all the three of us felt it looks is gonna work, and we said, okay, now we go to bed. We are not gonna check it because we want to go to bed happy. We are gonna sleep believing that we are right. And then at least until tomorrow morning, we're happy. Then we worry whether we, we're we gonna be happy for longer or not. You know, once you are happy, I mean, why you should have a crappy night checking at the test before going to bed, right? So first you go to bed, and then you worry. <laughs> so that's what we did then. Luckily the day after the Ethereum was still there. So it was a good uh, good moment. I'm impressed that you could have a good night's sleep, to be honest, after, uh, after thinking that you saw something, I'm impressed, but you know, there we go. <laughs> Um, let me talk to you. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Let me just talk to you about the, the medal itself. Uh, how did you hear that you'd won? What happened? Oh, yeah. So I was actually in Durham, in UK, because my wife was working there. And we were at home. And then I get uh, this email from the president of the MU, uh, the former president, Mori. And he told me that he wanted to, to talk to me on Skype. And then I just froze. I was like, oh my God. Because what else could it be? Why the president could want to talk to you, right? And that's the moment also, it was February. And I remember I called my wife, she reads the email, and then she collapsed on the floor, just, you know, like thinking, oh my God. But then we were also, okay, we are not 100% sure yet, right? So we cannot celebrate. So I remember 
sending an email, it was funny because he, he asked me, can you tell me in which time zone you are so that we can chat on Skype? Uh, and then I said, oh yeah, I'm on the UK time zone. You can call me tonight until uh, 8 p.m. and otherwise from tomorrow morning from 7 a.m. And my wife said, what? I mean, come on, he can call you anytime, even at <laughs> night. And I was like, no, I have a dignity to defend. I mean, no, I have to give him a precise schedule, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but it was a very long night because I didn't get a reply. I think he sent me the message before going to bed. He was in Japan. And so I waited, I woke up. I mean, I didn't sleep almost. And then in the morning I wake up, there is no email still. Finally sends me an email. Do you have a time in half an hour? I say, oh, sure. And then, you know, you are at Skype and say, oh, we would like to award you the Fields Medal. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, it was, yeah, it was amazing. I, I had never expected that because, you know, maybe it's the kind of thing you don't want to think about. I don't know how to say it. Right? It's uh, too much pressure. So I, I always try to do my stuff and do my mathematics without thinking about uh, the possibility of the medal. And then it came and it was really a big moment. So how much does that prize mean to you? Why is, why is the prize so important? I think so. First of all, um, I, I feel that the Fields Medal, you know, it's a prize for the person, but it's also a prize for uh, a community. So it's a recognition for a whole area. And I think it came out very well also from Francesco's presentation because you see that reality is not that, you know, I did my work alone. It's my work is part of a long project where many mathematicians contributed. And the fact that the optimal transport has been recognized and the fact that free boundaries have been recognized means that you know the community has been recognized. So I think it's important. It means that the mathematics we are doing, it's valued by the whole mathematical community. And then of course, you know, there is the personal side. Uh, it was a big satisfaction and also it has given me it has given me also the opportunity to, to do many things, you know, public lecture for uh, students. Uh, uh, so a kind of exposure and that it's important, I think, because, uh, you know, some, when, you, when you get a bit of celebrity, it's also can be used, you can use it for, and that's what I'm trying to do, especially in, uh, in Italy, actually. Well, I think that is a perfect point to pause our conversation. Uh, we are going to be joined by some of your peers in a moment for a panel discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to play the audience a few little videos. So we'll see you very shortly. Thank you, Hannah and Alessio, for that engaging and inspiring conversation. We will now hear from Professor Feridun Hamdlapur, President of the University of Waterloo. As I mentioned at the outset, the Fields Institute is a network of 21 principal sponsoring and affiliated universities and institutions. One of the major universities in this network is the University of Waterloo. Professor Hamdlapur is a professor of mechanical engineering and has authored hundreds of scholarly publications and supervised more than 50 graduate students. We will also hear from Professor Carlos Kenick, the president of the International Mathematical Union. He obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago after being an instructor at Princeton University and a professor at the University of Minnesota, Professor Kenig returned to the University of Chicago, where he is now Louis Bloch Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Mathematics. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and has spoken thrice at the International Congress of Mathematicians. Hello, Fields Medal Symposium from the University of Waterloo. We are incredibly proud to be in Canada and at Waterloo to be here and had the advantages Canada can provide. Having our university in Canada has allowed us to see growth and impact we never thought possible. As the home of North America's only dedicated faculty of mathematics, the Fields Medal Symposium is an important event in our calendar, in addition to its importance to the mathematical community. With more than 40,000 alumni from our faculty of mathematics and five decades of expensive fundamental research, including pioneering computer science teaching and research, we have seen the far-reaching implications of mathematics in our world firsthand, and it's only getting started. Expensive growth in technology and understanding the foundations of our world are shaping our society, and all of it is rooted in mathematics. And mathematics is having a tremendous impact 
allowing us to unlock the power of information. Some impacts we see directly, such as using AI and data to detect cancer earlier, and some we don't see at all, but the power of math is everywhere. Right now, we need more ideas, more perspectives, and more collaboration to continue to this march forward in the area of mathematics. And I know that efforts is at the heart of John Charles Fields and the Fields Institute. Having the Fields Institute right here in Canada is a true asset for our nation that fosters the growth and excellence in scholarship and mathematics. There are so many avenues of connection between researchers, students, institutions, industry, and society that we can foster and further strengthen. Entire industries have started from building these connections that lead from essential, fundamental research to practical applications. We have seen this at Waterloo with companies like OpenText that stem from a research project at the university only to be spun out into a globally recognized leader in information storage and distribution. I know through the continued efforts of the Fields Institute and its network of principals sponsoring and affiliate universities, we can build off of these connections for an impact we could only have once imagined. I would also like to take the opportunity to congratulate Professor Figali, who is being celebrated at this year's symposium. I hope that his achievements serve as an inspiration for so many young and aspiring members of today's audience. Congratulations to the Fields Institute for your continuing efforts to promote the collaboration and excellence in mathematics research and application. The University of Waterloo is proud to be a partner and part of the symposium. It does so much to connect and inspire students and researchers around the world. With my best wishes, have a great symposium and thank you. Hello everyone, I am Carlos Kenning, the president of the International Mathematical Union. It is a pleasure for me to take part in this year's Fields Medal Symposium, honoring Alessio Figali. This is particularly rewarding for me since Alessio's research has much in common with my own work. The Fields Institute and the International Mathematical Union, IMU, have a long and close relationship stemming from the fact that J.C. Fields, for whom this institute is named, was the initiator of the Fields Medal Award, the flagship award of the IMU, which is now recognized by many as the most prestigious award in mathematics. J.C. Fields was the lead organizer of the International Congress of Mathematicians, ICM, held in Toronto in 1924. After the Congress, there were unspent funds that had remained. Fields, who was very concerned with the lack of an award for mathematicians of the stature of the Nobel Prize, thought that it would be a good idea to use these remaining funds to endow a new prize in mathematics. It was planned that he would advance this idea at the 1932 ICM in Zurich, but he died in Toronto in the summer of 1932 before the Congress. In his will, he left a substantial amount of money for the purpose of establishing the prize, and this money, added to the leftover funds from the 1924 Congress, endowed the prize after Fields' proposal was accepted by the 1932 ICM in Zurich. The first Fields medals were awarded at the ICM in Oslo in 1936. Before his death, Fields explicitly asked that the award not be named after any person or place, but this wish was overruled after his death. Fields' conception of the awards was that they should be in recognition of work already done and an encouragement for further achievement, in contrast with the Nobel Prize. Following his wishes, the Fields medals are now awarded every four years, on the occasion of the ICM to recognize outstanding mathematical achievement for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. Currently, four medals are awarded to candidates under the age of 40. Over the years, the trust fund established by Field has had to be periodically supplemented and it is still significantly underfunded. The discrepancy in 2018 
was made up by the University of Toronto and the Fields Institute. Let me conclude by thanking the Fields Institute for their collaboration with the IMU, by congratulating Alessio Figali for this award, and by wishing you all a productive symposium. Thank you, President Hamdulapur and Professor Koenig for speaking on the Institute's relationships and collaborations, both with our principal sponsoring universities here in Canada and with the wider international mathematics community. Building on the previous conversation between Hannah and Alessio, let's open up the discussion now to include some very distinguished mathematicians from around the world. Joining Hannah and Alessio, we have Robert McCann, who's a professor at the University of Toronto and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Cedric Villani, who is himself a Fields Medalist in 2010 and currently a member of the Assemblée Nationale. Maria Colombo, who is a professor at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and who was a student of Figali. And Ingrid Dobeshi, who is a professor at Duke University and a former president of the International Mathematical Union. And now we come to one of my favorite moments of the evening. Uh, Alessio is joined in conversation with a number of his peers to uh, retell some of their greatest adventures, I think. Um, now, earlier on today, I went on Twitter to ask what the collective name should be for a group of world-class mathematicians. Uh, and there were some very good suggestions. Uh, someone said a sum of mathematicians, which I quite liked. There was also a bracket of mathematicians, which I think was my personal favorite. Um, of course, if you were all a group of geometrists, it would surely be a Euclid. Um, but I think we're going to settle on the most popular answer on Twitter today, which is a, a proof of mathematicians. So uh, I hope you're happy with that as your collective noun. Uh, now, I, I have to tell you that uh, we were going to be joined uh, Professor Ingrid Dobashi this evening, uh, who I'm sorry to say has been called away by a family emergency. Uh, we wish her and her family all the very best. But that said, we still have a stellar cast in this evening's Proof of Mathematics. Uh, first, we are joined by a man who was described by the New Yorker as the Lady Gaga of mathematics. Uh, what, what a title. Uh, Cedric Villani is a French politician and mathematician working primarily on partial differential equations, Riemann geometry and mathematical physics. The Fields Medal in 2010 and was the director of the Sorbonne University's Institut Henri Poincaré from 2009 to 2017. Now, Cedric Villani was also the PhD supervisor of Alessio, which uh, in many ways makes him the grandfather advisor or grand supervisor, that's what I'm calling it, of our next panelist, who in turn was Alessio's student. Uh, and I should tell you that Maria Colombo is a formidable mathematician in her own right. Uh, she was awarded her PhD in 2015 with a thesis on the flows of non-smooth vector fields and degenerate elliptic equations. She is currently a tenure track assistant professor of mathematics at EPFL, where she leads the chair of mathematical analysis, calculus of variations and PDEs. And she has a number of prizes along the way, including the Miranda Prize in 2018 and the Ia Picino prize in 2016, which I know I pronounced wrong, haven't I? I even, I even checked in with you in advance and I've got it wrong. I'd also uh, like to point out how impressive her chalkboard is. Um, I know that Alessia said he's not competitive, um, but uh, I think Maria's winning on that one. Um, now, last but not least, we have uh, Robert McCann, who has been a professor of mathematics at the University of Toronto since 1998. And uh, along with his collaborators and peers worldwide, Robert McCann has led a renaissance in the theory of optimal transportation, helping to it over the years uh, into one of the most vibrant and exciting areas in mathematics today. He's also been elected to fellowships in a number of learned societies, including the Field Institute, the American Mathematical Society, the Canadian Mathematical Society, and the Royal Society of Canada. Now, Robert is also a collaborator of Alessio. So we've got a line here then from Cedric, uh, through Alessio to Maria, and then uh, from Alessio to Robert too. Uh, is that kind of thing usual in a sort of collaborative environment, Robert? Do, do research partnerships tend to take this sort of shape? What would you say, a tree? Or a, what do you think? Well, the, the, um, I mean, there's also, I'm also a former collaborator of Cedric's. Ah. And, uh, and, you know, Maria is also an academic sibling of Alessio's in addition ah. to being a student. So there's a bit of incest going on in this tree. <laughs> so it's, and it's not a tree because you can have cycles, right? Of course, it's a fully connected graph in many ways. Right? <laughs> than, yeah. It's a graph, maybe not fully connected, yeah. <laughs> close, close. Um, Alessio, a question actually came in from, from YouTube about this idea about the technology. 
um, and uh, how important it is in, in passing on mathematical knowledge in a sort of intergenerational building of mathematical frameworks. What's your view on this idea of mathematical genealogy? Well, I mean, uh, I think uh, the resources are very important for shaping the, you know, the mathematical research of the students. So, of course, you know, this, this genealogy, you, I mean, you see where people come from. And I think it's uh, really what they do in the research. So in my research, I think I see a lot, if I look at it in retrospect, I see a lot about Luigi and Cedric. So all these, you know, three connected, in fact, there is more than just, uh, you, know, this, you know, mathematical blood, but really they influence the kind of uh, way of doing mathematics, the idea, the inspiration. Uh, uh, it's very important. I think uh, that's why I think the advisor has a very important role in the career of a, of a mathematician. Yeah, very much so. But of course, it's not just the advisors, it's, it's collaborators too, in many ways. And, and Maria, there was a question that also came in on YouTube, uh, which said, many people uh, view mathematics as an individual pursuit. Do you feel the same or do you feel that mathematics is better as a collaborative effort? Now, we can't quite hear you, Maria, I wonder. Are you muted? Uh, potentially, are you muted? I mean, that's the catchphrase of 2020, let's be honest. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go, we've got you. Yeah, well, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I, I see really as a collaborative environment also. I grew up uh, somehow in the same school where Alessio developed himself. And I see many common traits uh, in, uh, between very different people in the way they do mathematics, in the way they discuss mathematics. Also, I think Alessio somehow uh, never left uh, the first problems that uh, his advisors uh, proposed him uh, in some way, even though he developed it towards uh, other uh, areas as well. And, but, and this is from somehow the mathematical point of view, but also from the human point of view, um, I see some common aspects in the way people interact with each other. For instance, one thing that always impressed me is that both the door of uh, Luigi Ambrosio and the door of Alessio were always open. And they were both, uh, when I was a PhD student, even at the very first uh, experience, they were both answering my emails uh, within the day normally. And uh, this is something that is not so obvious in other communities. And uh, I think it has a common root uh, in a way of perceiving mathematics and of doing mathematics it, that is common to a certain school, usually. Yeah, I think that sounds important. Um, Cedric, as uh, Alessio's PhD advisor, how was he as a student? Ah, <laughs> advisor to student relation is always extremely important. And it's always the best situation when your student becomes your collaborator at some point. This has occurred to me with several of my uh, advice of my students. Let me first mention that it's very true what was said by Robert and by Maria. The relation of uh, genealogy in scientific terms is has a lot of influence on the subjects, but also on the style of mathematics that you use, the way you see problems and so on. And it's very important that Alessio was both student of Luigi Ambrosio and myself, and it's very clear in his work, the influence of the school that I represent and the school that Luigi represent, plus his own uh, specific uh, traits. Similarly, I was, I, I used to, I'm used to say that I was a student of four people. There was uh, Pierre Lyon, there was Yann Brenier, there was uh, Michel Ledoux, and there was uh, Eric Carlen. And I can see the influence of the four people in my work, plus some of my own uh, specific traits. As a student, Alessio, let's say the first characteristic was it was a very international adventure from the start. He was my student in Lyon. At the same time, he, had in, uh, he was working with Luigi Ambrosio in uh, Pisa. And then very quickly, it also developed into a lot of collaborations worldwide. And uh, this international a uh, feature is very essential in mathematics and science at the moment in which governments everywhere in the world are kind of shrinking on themselves and trying to put barriers 
towards other governments, it's very important for us to recover how international scientific research is. Second characteristic of, uh, of Alessio as a student was the speed, amazing speed at which it were, he was working. And there are anecdotes which I used to, to tell to other people uh, of me, suggesting a problem to Alessio in the morning and having the solution in the evening. And uh, there are many uh, stories about this uh, kind of uh, behavior of Alessio. I'm sure Robert has a couple of those uh, also. Third uh, thing with Alessio was the ease of communicating and always going to people. Now, Maria was saying it's so great to have uh, the door open when uh, uh, the, for the office of uh, Luigi or Alessio, but also these are people that go towards the people and always ask, which problems are you working on? What can I do? A very, uh, you know, uh, always uh, acting together, uh, acting to find new problems. And the fourth characteristic with Alessio is his ease of about reading and absorbing entire fields of mathematics that I have never seen in any other uh, young, young, young mathematician. Like he read my 1000 page book on optimal transport as if it was a Dostoevsky novel <laughs> and pointing to me all a uh, number of mistakes there, but also whenever there was a subject, I told him, you know, this is in the book of uh, Struck and Vardan, for instance, and then a few days later, he comes back and says, oh, I have read the entire book and here is the blah, 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 blah. And uh, this uh, absorbing mathematical sponge style was also very much striking. <laughs> what a response. Let's say I won't come to you for fear of uh, for fear of embarrassing you too much. So instead, Robert, let me come to you. I, I mean, all of you work in a very similar field. And I, I wondered if you could just give us a bit of an overview about how much that field has changed and developed over, say, the last decade or so and where you see it heading from here going forwards. So um, it's I mean, let's go. Let's go back three decades to when I started. So when I started, um, I was still a PhD student when my own advisor um, brought the work of Yann Brenier to my attention. And uh, that was really pivotal work at the end of the 80s and the beginning of 90s. And it was the when the Renaissance started, more or less. So it was the first connection that I've seen between optimal transport and partial differential equations, which is really the field that Alessio has continued to work in. And, um, and it developed, I would say, rather slowly over the 90s. And so Cedric, so I, I was working in it myself. I, wrote my, I used it a lot in my thesis. Yes, um, and Robert and I met in 1999, I guess. So yeah. already more than 20 years ago. Wow, wow, wow. How much has happened in between? And at that time we met, you were teaching a course in Atlanta, which I think became the source for your first book in 2003. That's right. And uh, it's sort of interesting. So I come from a tradition. I, I mean, so my advisor, I guess, has written one book, but he wrote it late in his career. But I was a graduate student at Princeton, and there were a few faculty members, like Eli Stein, that wrote books. But there were many faculty members that felt that, you know, they shouldn't, they should spend their time writing original research papers, and that they should leave to others the task of creating books. And I, I've really been impressed with the way that the books of Cedric and then later Filippo Sant'Ambrogio have really opened this area up to a huge number of people. And one of the other exciting things about the area is that it's thrown off tentacles in so many different directions. I mean, we heard about the connections to meteorology. It's also connected to Einstein's theory of gravity, as we learned only in the last couple of years, Ramanian geometry through the work of Cedric and others. Um, so Cedric's advisor, Pierre-Louis Lyons, got his Fields Medal for work on the viscosity theory of solutions to partial differential equations. And I remember Craig Evans saying that, you know, he ne he said, that uh, optimal transport has thrown off tentacles in more different directions than he'd ever seen, you know, including viscosity theory. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you, uh, I, I once had a conversation with uh, Tim Gowers, Fields medalist Tim Gowers, um, who told me that um, he had worked out a mathematically optimal way to unload his dishwasher. Um, I should tell you that it was uh, apparently his uh, his family weren't particularly best pleased about this. But, <laughs> but I, I do wonder, actually, with all of you, give, you know, the field that you work in, do you ever find yourself applying it to your to your everyday life, as it were? Do you ever find yourself doing something like uh, working out an optimal solution for, for emptying your dishwasher? Any of you? It's very, very, very rare. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Gow's on his own. <laughs> He's on his own. There um, are. I'm sure there are some, uh, okay, in the, let's say, uh, uh, 
there are some examples, there are a lot of examples in which you can apply uh, mathematics in everyday life, but and in the field of politics, it's good to remember that one of the founders of probability theory, I'm thinking of Emile Borel, was doing it also because he wanted to found decision theory and uh, his daily work in politics was also one of the things that he wanted to uh, put, uh, in which he wanted to put more mathematics into. But most of the people who apply mathematical reasoning in their life do it, say, on a fuzzy basis, not applying theorem, uh, just uh, retaining the spirit of some, the some theory. That's fair. <laughs> That's very fair, actually. You mentioned you mentioned pol politics there, um, Sergio. I, I want to come on to that, actually, because we had an amazing question come in on YouTube from uh, Hernin Cheng. Um, I'll bring this to you, Alessio, and then possibly um, get your comment to Maria, if you don't mind. Uh, it's, it's quite a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, they said, is it OK for mathematicians who do work in extremely, even though the world is in such crisis? Do mathematicians have a responsibility to do more applied work to tackle these crises? What are your thoughts on that, Alessio? Well, I mean, um... There are crises in the world, and I think, uh, you know, uh, that's due to many things. But as mathematicians, you know, we go on in our research, but it's not that we are not doing anything for society. So uh, one has to think that, you know, pure ma there are pure mathematicians and applied mathematicians. And the reality is that none of them exist with, without the others, in the sense that all the, the latest developments now, even, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence that is so fashionable now, it uses some of the results. It uses optimal transport in some aspects. So, um, real, so if there wasn't the pure math behind uh, a lot of the applied developments, we wouldn't see what we have. So what I mean is that it would be stupid and, let's say, uh, short-sighted, actually, that's probably that's the word, to just say, oh, we need to do something applied. Because the reality is that applied research is, is, uh, is happening all the time. And as mathematicians, it's not that if we shift, if we all shift to applied, we'll make mathematics progress better. Uh, it would be just, you know, you feel that now you have more work power, but on the long run, you know, down in the road, 20, 30 years, uh, you, you will have, in fact, less, I think, advancement because uh, reality, we go on together. I see... As I say, applied math uses a lot of theorems for pure math, but at the same time, the fact that there are questions from applied math reach the pure mathematician. The pure mathematician think them from a you know, more abstract viewpoint, and sometimes they can make discoveries that then have fundamental applications. So I think it's very good, and I like a lot the question because it makes a point, like you know, scientists need to help society. Scientists need to work for the good of society and for the development, but... Uh, uh, one needs to be careful when uh, one is too focused on the short-term applications because then, uh, you know, uh, for research doesn't work. I think uh, for the development of research doesn't work. Let me um, just change the question ever so slightly to come to you, I think that was very persuasive. Um, we had another question uh, uh, that says, what hope does mathematics have to offer humanity in terms of the increasingly complex problems faced by civilization? You never know. <laughs> you never know first to tackle what uh, Alessio has been, to, just to, to build on what Alessio said. You never know in advance what mm -hmm. is applied or not. You never know in advance what will be used to solve a problem or not. And if it's very uh, sophisticated problems, maybe statistics will transform the many factor complexity into something simpler. Maybe it will be something coming from uh, analysis or who knows. I will, even though it's not uh, exactly the, 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 the question, but it's related to, I will build on the artificial intelligence example that Alessio was, uh, was saying and on my uh, experience with it. When I was, uh, when I uh, chose my subject in, um, in mathematics, when I was 20 something and decided I want to go in partial differential equations, I wanted the subject to have some applications. And I went to into Boltzmann equation and uh, problems about uh, gas. Asking my PhD advisor right from the start, what are the applications of this? 
And it was very clear that it, this would lead me, leave me, lead me very far from the subject of uh, artificial intelligence, which at those at the, in that time was taken only by a few diehards of uh, mathematical logic. And after I went into the subject of uh, Boltzmann equation, I discovered that I was in love with the subject, not for its applications, but really for the formal beauty of it. I went into optimal transport because there was a connection between uh, uh, Boltzmann equation and optimal transport find, found by a Japanese researcher in the 70s. I remember, I remember Pierre Rullions telling me, okay, it's fine if you want to study optimal transport, but does it really have applications? And in those days, it indeed seemed that uh, optimal transport was very much in the theory. But much later applications came in. The first time I had discussion with the uh, uh, Canadian's most famous specialist of, uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence, uh, Yusha Benjo, and I started to explain him what I'm doing. He told me exactly this. There's no need for you to explain me what you're doing. In the AI field, we've been studied, studying a lot optimal transport these days, and we know how useful it is. And here, this is an exam perfect example in which a field that seems to be at the opposite of uh, the application that you think turns out to have applications precisely in this, uh, in this field. And this is not rare. It's very, very common. Mm -hmm. And you never know where the theory will come from that will solve your difficulties. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think that's very true, the real value of blue sky research. Maria, did you want to jump in on that question? Yes, I, I, I agree with what uh, Alessio and uh, Cedric are, are saying. Also, my first answer about the responsibility that we have in this uh, global crisis of the last years, uh, my first answer is that uh, I want to do my job as seriously as possible. That's what I'm able to do, and that's the contribution I can give in uh, first seeing at this beauty that uh, Cedric was mentioning and in somehow bringing it up more and more. Um, yeah, and. <clears throat> and then, as Cedric was saying, there are uh, thousands of examples of uh, things that were studied just for uh, the goal of understanding them, and then then turned out to have applications. I'm I'm not maybe so much able to find these applications sometimes, even though there is a constant dialogue then with the people who work in more applied fields, where sometimes ideas come up and new problems are suggested to the more theoretical sides. So um, maybe I, I'm from more from the theoretical side, uh, but there are thousands of examples and many of them are really everyday life, really. Like uh, you can think at all the study of number theory that has been done and the way it's used now through cryptography or uh, in the way even uh, bank transactions work. So, and these examples are really everywhere. And my impression is uh, that somehow first we, we as uh, a collective group, we understand how things work, we understand in depth them, and then the intuitions, intuition and uh, many other factors will bring up how to use them. Not all, not all of them. But uh, I was also very impressed in the way optimal transport is uh, nowadays in, applied. I'm working myself on applications which uh, regard quantum chemistry. It's something uh, amazing. Yeah, you just don't know where things will end up. I just want to pick up, actually, you mentioned them, Marie. You mentioned this idea of beauty. And um, I mean, this is something that you hear from mathematicians a lot, right? You know, and, and I sort of wonder if you are uh, talking to somebody who is, uh, let's say, only ever had the experience of, of school mathematics, hearing mathematics described as elegant and beautiful, it might seem like they're very strange words to choose. Um, so, Robert, I might come to you on this one, actually. Why do you think that mathematicians find their subject so romantic? Oh, well, I do. <laughs> uh, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I totally understand that there is a problem of language, which makes it uh, 
less easy, for instance, than art, because I would um, compare mathematics and art on, ma on many aspects. But mathematics as a whole language that needs to be somehow shared in order to enjoy this kind of discussion. But uh, I think that many people would be surprised uh, uh, when hearing two mathematicians, that, uh, as, as I was doing with, with Alessio, and I'm doing also with Alessio, when they discuss about math, uh, and they, they speak uh, of, uh, of living objects, not of... Uh, not through formulas and, uh, I don't know, proofs uh, with the ordered uh, mathematics. It's more like a, dis a discussion where uh, certain ideas emerge uh, and uh, one looks at them from different point of views uh, and uh, one compares the point of views, one disagrees a bit. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, I, I see this uh, as this sort of uh, lively um, interaction. Yeah, so, um, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a couple of things. One of the um, one of my colleagues says, you know, in order to be a great mathematician, it's not enough to it's it's necessary but not sufficient to be intelligent and to work hard. These abstract concepts also have to take on a life for you because otherwise you couldn't care about them enough to do anything with them. So they have to have a reality, and they don't for everyone. Uh, but why is it a romantic subject? One of the things is the time scale. Um, you know, we have these problems that have been open for in some cases hundreds of years. And um, there's, I was very excited when I was a PhD student and uh, Fermat's last theorem was finally proved by Andrew Wiles because you had the sense that maybe, you know, maybe if Fermat and nobody else could do it after 200 years, it just wasn't within the realm of something that humans could do. But in fact, what you see is that everyone has made progress and people learn from what others have done before them. And actually the generation time in mathematics is less than the generation time of humans. So, you know, uh, uh, Alessio is, I think, eight, years younger than Cedric in Fields Medal age and maybe in PhD age as well, or maybe 12 years, I don't, maybe I don't have it quite right, but 10 years, something like that. <laughs> so the generation time is short, so we can actually progress more quickly in mathematics than maybe in some other aspects of human life. And um, I also wanted to touch on, well, I had this experience myself when I was a high school student, I was doing computer programming competitions, and I had a machine, a Commodore 64, that most of you are not old enough to remember, but I knew the machine inside out. And then when I, got to, when I got to university, uh, I was studying engineering. Uh, the faculty required me to buy an IBM PC. And all of a sudden, all of this arcane knowledge I had about the, you know, how the Commodore 64 was wired became completely irrelevant. And I swore never again would I make that investment in knowledge that was going to become completely irrelevant. And so, you know, if you're, if you're a lawyer or something, the laws can change. If you're a, a, a tax specialist, the... But in mathematics, once something has been established, it stays true for a long time. And I also think that that's one of the things that mathematics can offer to society. So on the one hand, mathematics is a kind of superpower that allows us to do experiments in areas that we can't access in other ways. So we, we understand that the universe started in a big bang because we can solve a mathematical equation that predicts a singularity. And maybe for COVID, there are experiments you can do using statistics that you, to tease out information that we wouldn't have any other access to or models, mathematical models. Um, but the other thing that mathematics can offer to people in an era where fake news has become a big problem, and probably we, need, we all need to do a better job of communicating this to our students, is um, we have a method for deciding whether something is correct or not, and for evaluating information and, uh, and thinking critically. And I think that's really an important, uh, an important thing that mathematics has to offer to society. Alexia, I'm gonna come to you actually on first on the, the, the point about beauty and, and, and finding it a romantic subject. But I think another um, another thing that uh, is, is a commonplace in terms of public perceptions of mathematics is this idea that people do their best maths when they're young. Um, and indeed, you have to be under 40 years old to win, to win a Fields Medal. I wonder what your thoughts are on why that is said of mathematics and not of other subjects, and also whether you think it's true. I mean, you've got your Fields Medal now, uh, you know, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the best work when you're young? Yeah, so of course there is a very beautiful romantic image, right, about this idea, and I think, and it comes from nice also stories, which probably on the one end are beautiful, like you know Galois who did what fantastic mathematics, and then he died extremely young uh, in a romantic in a duel. duel. So fantastic. In a duel. Yeah. 
in a duel. <laughs> so, I mean, even that good, right? Um, but then it's also damaging because it gives the wrong image. The reality is that it's not true. I, I mean, we have tons of counterexamples to these statements. The reality is that you do mathematics until the end of your life, and there are many, many mathematicians have do, done fantastic contributions, and they were way above, uh, you know, 50, 60, uh, whatever, right? I mean, you can really do a lot of stuff. Maybe when you're young, you know, uh, there are two advantages. On the one end, you have more energies uh, and probably you're more ignorant, which sometimes can help because, <laughs> oh, yes. you know, the less you know, sometimes uh, it helps because you're not distracted by work that other people do in the wrong direction. But uh, I think this is uh, still a minority of cases. If we really do you know, a lot of advancement, there is, oh, especially now, mathematics has become so complex and there are so many things that happen all the time that experience plays also a huge role. So the more uh, time, the, the older you grow, the more mathematics you know, the more connection you can make, the more you have seen, you know, the more you can still do. So I think it doesn't work anymore like that. And uh, also we see that mathematics as we also discussed at the very beginning when you asked to Maria, right? It's, uh, it's not uh, a work of, uh, you know, uh, lonely people. I mean, it's done through collaborations. So uh, even in collaborations, maybe there are younger and older people, but they all contribute one way or another. So uh, I, I don't know. Um, as, I mean, if one looks at this, even at the story of the Fields Medal, there was it was never meant really to be a prize under 40 because they thought that under 40 was the age limit to do mathematics. It was a other historical reason, but it's nice to tell you like that, right? It's more, uh, it's a better story, I think, but uh, I don't think it's, <laughs> it's true. Okay, so good days ahead. Good days ahead, let's see if you. <laughs> yeah, still. Cedric, do you want to jump in? Well, it's true the, the, the first through the Fields Medal at the beginning was meant to be prized to for the young mathematicians was not supposed to be seen as it has become, but uh, it was from the beginning. It came from the beginning with the goal to um, reward young mathematicians and to be part of the to be part of the community of mathematicians. That's a big difference between the Fields Medal and Nobel Prize. First is the age limit, so reward the young people. Second is the fact that it's at the same time of the International Congress of Mathematicians, and it's awarded by the um, International Union of Mathematics, which is like democratic emanation of all the mathematicians worldwide. So it's in the name of the of the mathematical community and in front of the mathematical community. Uh, a little, you know, like the local adaptation of by the people, for the people, in the name of the people. And that's very democratic. In that sense, it's not the same as a prize awarded by an academy, as is the, as is the Nobel Prize. Um, the age and the, uh, I think the discussion about the age, the discussion about the uh, way mathematics being done cannot be separated from the discussion on art and beauty that Anna you started and on which you yourself wrote uh, some uh, papers and books. And uh, we know that uh, mathematics, the, the 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 form is very much important. The format, the way you prove things, not just the, the what you prove, the style because you're all working on the reasoning, that's the basic thing, that the stuff that you are working on, and the reasoning has to be sharp, it has to be elegant, it has to be uh, powerful, and uh, you cannot work with the reasoning without some aesthetic sense. Uh, you need it, we all mathematicians know we need the aesthetic sense to guide us, like the, you know, like the, the lamp in the, in the dark, Otherwise, we would be completely lost in the ocean of possibilities. A physicist has experiments to, to you know, to 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 find uh, his way or her way and separate what is impossible from from what is possible. In mathematical reasoning, there are so many possibilities that you need some uh, way to guide and eliminate the ugly, keep the keep the beautiful. <laughs> Except that there are occasions when beauty is not the best guy. There are occasions when ugly wins, right? 
That is correct, <laughs> but at least you've tried. And uh, the sense of what is ugly and what is uh, beautiful can change from decade mm. to decade or from century to century. It's a cultural construction. But uh, also, you know, there are now there was a time in which proofs based on axiom of choice, very abstract, were found very uh, elegant. Now we found that it's cheating and we prefer, many mathematicians prefer to use constructive proof and the beauty is in the construction. Uh, to talk about Alessio's work, a lot of the, the power of Alessio often in many papers is the possibility to build on very simple observations and uh, and very elementary tools. So there were some papers that I know or some situations that I knew in which a big hammer had been used to produce a theorem and in which Alessio and collaborators were able to prove stronger results for more elementary techniques uh, like fine, fine knitting. And that also what is beautiful, what is not, it depends on your taste and on the uh, evolution. But you always need this thing. And sometimes, of course, you may end up using brute force to for some for some problems but even the most ugly of papers uh, you have to find some it has to have some beautiful idea in it otherwise it cannot yeah. be good nothing it's true well, let's let's come on to that, that idea. oh go ahead sorry Maria, go ahead I can interact on this um, I was also always very impressed since we are speaking also of uh, other people's work on uh, um, and so it's true, the mathematics builds on uh, uh, thousands of years of discoveries and ideas that a person needs to master. And one thing that really impressed me when I met uh, scientifically Alessio uh, was uh, the fact that he was uh, uh, building his own intuition of uh, very classes. He would never be satisfied by an answer like, uh, ah, this was said in that paper. And his next question would be, ah, yeah, and why? Or maybe not, not needing for an entire proof, but at least an intuition of what's going on, of the mm, interesting example there of the situation where there was a real progress in that certain paper. So uh, he has this uh, living uh, way of interpreting what is, was done before and very original. And I think that was also the somehow the starting point of some of his work, some new ways of looking at things that were resolved, maybe in an uglier way before. <laughs> and sometimes, and sometimes it's better to have a beautiful, false idea of why something is true than a true, ugly uh, <laughs> argument. And sometimes even you can make it in the, in the proofs. I remember in some of my talks, writing some things like, Okay, for the sequel of the argument, let's assume that uh, the reals, uh, that, the, that space is bounded. Of course, I was working in Euclidean space, so it was obviously false, but it allowed to do uh, this, this for, with this false uh, premise, like uh, there was a very beautiful, simple argument. And of course, the true argument has to be more complicated. But if you are able to, to, to give a hint, of what's the idea, the reason for 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 some result, uh, then it's good, and that's really a thing of the mathematical culture. How we think of of uh, of mathematics in the same way, in the to speak rigorously, there's no such thing as uh, uh, an important fact and an unimportant fact. If you are in a proof, it all has to be true. And all has to be good, and your computer will not accept the program if there is one bug, and your proof will not be true if there is one bug. But we all know in mathematics that we think of some arguments being more important than others, some steps being more crucial than others, and that's the way we organize our thinking of the proof. Let me let me come to you, Alicia, because your colleagues have said some really lovely things about the elegance of your work. But um, I can imagine that when you are doing it forwards, uh, when you're sort of living through it, it the, the, the path that isn't always necessarily that clear. Because we had a question that came in from uh, Michael from a Toronto based high school, who said that many students don't know what to do when faced with a problem I've not taught them uh, how to solve uh, and very quickly give up. What do you do when you're stuck and what helps you persevere? How do you find that elegant path, Alessio? Okay, so let's see. Uh, 
so now that so we start maybe from the question really the, from the student right because i remember myself when i started to see as a, a high school student problems from the math olympiads they really had no clue how to solve them and what they did was very you know uh, the only thing i could do was since i don't know how to solve it let's look for the solution i mean like they've written someone posted it online whatever let's read the solution and then I say, and then by reading the solution, I see how someone else did it. And then I go to the next problem, which will be maybe similar to it. And because I read the solution, the problem is really not the same, but you know, it has some similarities. I have a chance to do something. And you know, you go on like this for quite a few times, quite some time. And I remember maybe the first 10 problems, I could not solve none of them, but just I was trying every time to say, okay, let's see if what I just learned from the previous proof can help him now. And uh, one thing where you have, one has to be persistent is to stay in front of a problem for quite some time and just try whatever possible computation, whatever uh, crazy idea, even if it doesn't bring anywhere, because that it's only why spending time that then you really learn you can really also learn the proofs later. So, um, you know, by reading only once, it enters, it goes out. If you spend a lot of time and then you read the proofs, you're like, you're like, ah, that was the idea. But you see where it is because you spend so much time with your brain on it. And so uh, that was the path for me to start to do some basic proof in exercises. Then when I went on as a mathematician, the point is mathematics is that you don't really, some, the point is that no one tells you really what you have to do, because it's not like solve this problem and you already know that there is an answer. So you also have to come up with a question and the answer at the same time. And of course, the goal is to make the answer as the best possible answer you can give to a problem. Um, now, the one thing that I always tried was to, as also Cedric mentioned, you have to first to simplify the problem as much as possible. So start from the very simple example. You want to prove something put yourself in the simplest possible situation and ask yourself, how would I prove it in this case? And then add difficulties on and on. You start to add, you know, to make the problem more complex, add more, comp more difficult situations. So you, you are free to add the assumptions sometimes and see, okay, but if I had this extra assumption, would I be able to solve it? And um, that's the way, right? So you, you build intuition and, uh, Maybe I think we are very much inspired by other people. I remember uh, when I was even a first year student, and, this, and that's probably also one of the, re the reasons probably then I put some analysis. I was very much inspired by my analysis professor in PISA, uh, Giovanni Alberti, because he would come to the class and give, uh, uh, teach us some analysis one, analysis two theorem, and he would say, okay, today, the proof is really ugly. So if I give you the proof, you will not understand why the result is true. So today I will give you a false proof of the theorem, but uh, this will give you the idea of the result. And tomorrow we do the real rigorous proof. And I loved it. I mean, because really you get the idea and then you can do the proof. So it's a two-step process and you need both of them. You need a technique and the only way to build technique is really to, to do it many, many times. It's just, you know, machinery. And uh, the same way you learn how to write, you learn how to prove mathematical things, you just need exercise. But the fact that you're able to do this abstraction and really understand the core, where is the key point, why something can be true even, there you need to also do sometimes a bit of false proof uh, because that's the only way to grasp if something makes sense. So, you know, we, we have to learn from everyone. And... Uh, um, yeah, so that's my strategy. I think everyone has his own way of doing mathematics. There is no universal way. There is no good way. I think we need each, each of us needs to find its own way. But one reality is that we need to work. I mean, there is no <laughs> cheap solution and, you know, do a lot of exercises and uh, train ourselves on, on problems. The, there is no, as I say, magical answer coming from up. Yeah. So, so I, always tell my I always tell my students that you learn more by working out the details for the problem that you can actually solve than by banging your head against the one that you can't solve. So I, I'm a very strong believer in analogy. So if you're working on a problem that's too hard, try to find an analogous problem that's easier to solve and solve that first. And yeah.
then find another problem that's analogous, maybe in a different way, and solve that problem, and then go back and try to put them together and solve the hard problem. How do you shield against discouragement, though? I mean, what you're describing, uh, I mean, works well for things where you know there's an answer, but there are occasions when you are, uh, where you don't know necessarily if, there, if, if what you're trying to achieve is even possible. How do you shield against discouragement in that situation, Robert? How do I shield against it? Well, mm. sometimes the analogous problem turns out to be interesting by itself. So sometimes you have to give up on the original problem and do something else. Um, uh, so Terry Tao has better advice than I do in this respect. Terry Tao says, uh, you know, if one problem is not working, work on it, you know, have several projects going at once. And if you're not motivated to work on one of them, work on a different one. Or prepare your next lecture or write a letter of reference. <laughs> it's completely true. And of course, when it's Terry Tao, we know he works on 100 problems at the same time. But just having a few going on at the same time is indeed uh, a good recipe. And, and uh, to just to share at some periods in my career in which I found myself like losing motivation, which is the worst problem uh, for a researcher, I regained the motivation each time by working on the book or course or synthesis and uh, it was in particular the beginning of my uh, book on uh, my optimal optimal transport, old and new book. Uh, uh, it, at, I started it at a time in which I was rather discouraged. And when I ended writing the book, I was on the contrary, very much excited about all the beautiful things that they were remaining to discover. Well, I really Maria, sorry, sorry, I just want to bring Maria in on this. Do you... Um, do you have periods where you feel very discouraged too? Okay, so uh, the first thing I have to say is that uh, if I have to quantify it, I think roughly 90% of my time goes on something that in the end, uh, and on which in the end, maybe I give up or so. So, I mean, it's a very common uh, feeling. <laughs> um, what to do? Well, I, I don't know, I don't have a recipe for sure. The other people have more experience on this. Maybe uh, one thing I noticed is that sometimes working hard on something, I learn ideas that then after a month, a year or whatever, come into the game again, because it's something that really became mine. So sometimes, even though something doesn't come, I, I try to write down what I got, the reasons why some attempts that I were doing uh, were could not go through, and uh, yeah, and and luckily this is, um, I mean, often we we can get really a feel maybe we cannot get a full proof of something, but we can get a, a feeling of why a certain idea could go cannot go, or what is the boundary of it, what maybe uh, even in a vague way. What else could could be an ingredient that could help in that so that this points in another direction that um, makes me start the day after, I don't know, reading something or studying. So I, I don't know, it's a complicated dynamics for me. I, yeah. <sighs> Robert, maybe I if I just uh... nodding enthusiastically during that. Um, but I also wanted to say, actually, Robert, you earlier on, um, you said that it was uh, necessary but not sufficient for a, a student to be intelligent, to be a mathematician. I just wonder whether, uh, to add to that, and alongside this idea of, of, of dealing well with frustration uh, during research, do you think that being a research mathematician requires a kind of aptitude that can't be taught? Do you think that you need to be born with a gift for it? I think it helps. There are... <laughs> there are many ways to be a good mathematician. I remember how much I was impressed by Pierre Rillions when I started working with him and could see his amazing speed of and power on the on problems and thinking, okay, this type of level is not for me because my intrinsic capacities in thinking are not at the same uh, level. The, the speed is not the same and so on. It took me many years to understand that power and speed of the thinking is just one element, but there are many skills and ways in which your mathematical career can go on. And the ability to find the right collaborators 
to find the right subject, to ask the right question, to be in the right place at the right moment. And I cannot say more to describe it, are at least as important. Robert. Um, so let's see, I'm not sure. Um, but I started out thinking that I was going to uh, study engineering and then I went to university and there were a lot of courses to take, a lot of labs to take, and uh, I found myself not very motivated. And when I started skipping even my math and physics classes or sweeping through them, I knew that something was wrong. And so I switched to physics. And then in my second year, I switched to mathematical physics. And then in my third year, in order to get a degree with physics in it, you need to do a general lab course. But I was busy producing musicals at the time. And so I decided to put off the lab course until my fourth year. And when I dropped an advanced mechanics course, it became clear that I was going to get a degree in mathematics. Um, and I somehow followed my nose. I think Alessio said it was natural to do the master's after the bachelor's and the PhD after. So I somehow, you know, my father, when he told me how he decided to become an optometrist and he said, it was after the war and I wasn't a young man anymore. So I looked around for a field that would provide an adequate income when it would, that wouldn't take too long to learn and would provide an adequate income when it was done. And optometry was only three years instead of four. And so... <laughs> this kind of thinking played no, practical thinking played no effect on my career choice. Maybe it should have played more of an effect. On the other hand, I also learned that in, when I was in grade one or two, uh, my principal advanced me from grade one to grade two in the same year. And he told my parents at that time that I would become a mathematician. And this was something that they never shared with me until I'd completed a PhD in mathematics. So I think there, there can be some initial aptitude, but you also have to follow it up and develop it. So you need, again, you need aptitude and you need hard work. And on that idea then, Alessio, I think we will uh, leave the final question to you. On that idea of everything that we talked about, about being stuck, about elegance, about having natural aptitude, but that being a, a number of different ways that you could be talented. What single piece of advice would you give? To, if you could go back and talk to your 17 year old self, what single piece of advice would you give yourself or, or perhaps more generally to, to, to young students who one day dream of becoming a, a Fields Medal winner, a, a, a professional mathematician? What's your advice? Maybe the first advice is don't start by thinking that you have to be to, to win something big because it will put too much pressure. I never thought about it and I think uh, that was good. Um, so. The point, the first point is follow the passion, I think. So, you know, I did mathematics, it became immediately a passion for me, something that I really loved, I enjoyed doing it. And so going to university, you know, going to class was a pleasure, it was not it was not like, you know, going to school and you have to do your homework. It's really something you are happy to learn. And then everything becomes easier and everything becomes much more natural. Uh, then, uh, of course, the mistake that some people do, you know, when you're skilled in something, you believe it can help you throughout your life, and that's wrong. So never be, trust your much, that much your skills. You have to train them, as every professional does. You know, even the most talented soccer players they have to train all the time. So that's important. So go on, follow your path, follow your passion, train for, and try to achieve and try to achieve the best you can. So I think that's also what I always tried. And, uh, you know, I, I met many mentors in my life that have been inspiring me one way or another. And there was one professor I met when I was very young and he told me, oh, okay, with you, what I realized is that if I raise a bit the bar, then you are able, after some time, to always jump the bar. And I still don't know, where is your bar? He was saying me that when I was 18, 19. Um, so, I kept this attitude. I put the bar, which is higher where I, than I am, and I try to jump it. But I don't ask myself, where is the last one? So I kept going on and just trying to do the best I could. And you know, uh, when I entered school normal, I thought I, I started and I felt I was the last one of my class. And I just thought, okay, maybe I will be kicked out because students are kicked out of school normal. Statistical, at least one or two mathematicians. So maybe it's me because I feel the last one. But I thought, if I have to be kicked out, I have to do the best I can for this not to happen. Then, if that's what it is, you know, I, one has to be realistic, right? I still made it to, to enter. We were only 10, so it was still a success. So I just tried to always do my best. 
And, uh, and that's, I think, what people should do. Do your best, try to achieve as much as you can in life. And also, you know, you have to remember, we are not made of one thing, right? It's not because, you know, we make a big success in one field like mathematics. This means that we are a great person. Maybe there are, there are mathematicians that are better than me. I never, I don't expect to be the best in anything, but I think as a, as a person, we are made of many things, right? We are human beings, we are made of, uh, you know, uh, personal relationship, uh, and uh, we are much more complex than just being a mathematician. So, you know, maybe there is someone who is better than me in something, and maybe I'm better than some that person in something else. So that's some message in life, right? Uh, in everything, we just have to do the best we can in life. And just to conclude about thinking about Fields Medal, some one person to blame for putting pressure on me is Cedric. <laughs> because uh, in 2010, when he got the medal, he looked at me and he told me, and I never thought about Fields Medal before, he told me, oh, you know, it was a really a lot of pressure for me because 2010 was my last chance. This was, you know, for Cedric was his last chance. And then he told me, never get into that position. So <laughs> I, so, just get the medal in 2018 because it would be too stressful to try to get in 2022. <laughs> so that's what he told me in 2010. He told me exactly that. You have to get it in 2018. <laughs> so, but besides that... <laughs> you see how Alessio followed my advice. I always follow... <laughs> it's true. Advice. A see, good I always advice follow the advice. There we go. Especially two, <laughs> two key thoughts to end on. Be the best person you can be and fo follow Cedric Milani's advice. <laughs> I think we will leave that there. All that remains is to thank my wonderful panel, uh, Robert, Maria, Cedric, and of course, Alicia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Hannah, Alicia, and all the panelists and the audience for that very lively discussion, which gave us all some insights into how mathematics is done. I want to round out the event by inviting several leaders in science policy and in the communication of science to share their thoughts with us. Their ideas on the importance of advancing the study of mathematics, as well as the communication of mathematics, fit into the themes we have been discussing. Professor Alejandro Adem is the president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. He's also professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia, and has published more than 70 papers in algebraic topology and group cohomology. Prior to assuming the presidency at NSERC, Alejandro served as the CEO and scientific director of MITAX, and before that, he was the scientific director of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Alejandro is a tireless advocate for excellence and research opportunity. Alejandro will be followed by Professor Mona Nemer, the chief science advisor to the prime minister. She is a distinguished scholar in molecular genetics and cardiac regeneration and has held faculty positions at the University de Montréal and at the University of Ottawa. She's also served as the Vice President of Research at the University of Ottawa. Professor Nemer has been taking a very visible role in the Canadian response to the pandemic and is a strong advocate for science at the national level. Our final speaker for today will be Greg Kelly from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Greg is the executive producer of the program Ideas. With a DPhil in English literature from Oxford, he produces documentaries that speak to the head and the heart. I've enjoyed many hours of conversation with Greg on the need to communicate mathematics with the general public, and I'm delighted that he's agreed to share his thoughts with us today. Hello, my name is Alejandro Adam, and I am president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to celebrate the remarkable achievements of Alessio Figali, on the occasion of the 2020 Fields Medal Symposium. Professor Figali works in the field of partial differential equations, and his work has had an amazing impact on all of mathematics and science. This event is organized by the Fields Institute, which is a world-class research institute based right here in Toronto. The Fields Institute is supported by the major research universities in Ontario, and what they do is bring the best and most accomplished mathematicians from around the world to work on problems, on research problems, which are of great relevance not only to mathematics, but to society at large. I want to highlight here the role that the Fields Institute has played 
in involving mathematicians in the modeling of the COVID-19 pandemic. They have organized a mathematics modeling task force to discuss and work on best approaches for modeling this terrible scourge. They have received significant funding from the Canadian government for doing this, and I'm very encouraged by the results they have obtained so far. I want to applaud this work by the Fields Institute that is really having a beneficial impact for all Canadians. Congratulations to Professor Figali for his great mathematics and to the Fields Institute for being a beacon of excellence based here, right in Toronto, Canada. Thank you. Bonjour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Fields Medal Symposium. Bienvenue à tous à la Conférence 2020 et merci à l'Institut Fields de m'avoir invité. The vital and increasing need for math in our society is evident. It certainly is evident to me. Maybe because I minored in math in my undergrad and I'm a bit of a closet mathematician. I applaud your dedication to develop and adapt mathematics to addressing the world's complex problems. And to the pure mathematicians, I love you too. I recall the last time I spoke to the Fields Institute, I issued you a challenge. Why not develop a list of the most pressing mathematical problems related to global challenges of the 21st century. That request was intended to spark a larger, multidisciplinary conversation. At the time, I had no idea how prescient it was. Here we are, two years later, in the midst of a global pandemic that has brought society to its knees. Comme vous savez, les derniers huit mois ont été marqués par les défis de la pandémie. Quel casse-tête! Heureusement, ce sont des défis que les mathématiciens aiment relever. As I look back on what we, the scientific community, have accomplished, I can say that science and math are leading the fight in defeating COVID-19. I'm sure you'll agree. And our work is enabled thanks to the collective multidisciplinary effort by the scientific community, which of course includes the field of mathematics. Just before the pandemic took hold in Canada, I had assembled task forces and expert groups to address emerging questions around COVID-19 and to inform government response. In fact, we have a dedicated expert group on modeling made up of mathematicians, epidemiologists, to provide policy guidance. Many of these experts are familiar faces to the Institute's ongoing program. They, along with other experts, provided and continue to provide invaluable advice on predicting and managing the spread of the disease, identifying hotspots across the country, developing recovery strategies, and identifying data gaps. This was a very helpful contribution to the national response, as evident in the government's support for modeling. I am profoundly grateful for all the expert advice I've received, some of whom are listening to this uh, talk today. No one can say how long it will take to defeat COVID-19. But as I said earlier, there is no doubt that science is leading the fight. And I hope that you, as mathematicians, share my belief in the leadership that science can provide. Going forward, we need more mathematicians to step up and participate in public discourse. Grâce à vous tous, on va réussir à surmonter le défi de la COVID et les autres défis à venir. I'm confident that with the help of the Fields Institute and everyone who's listening to this uh, short talk, we can solve this puzzle and the many challenges ahead. I wish you all the best for a successful and stimulating symposium. Bonne conférence à tous et merci de m'avoir écouté. 
As things wrap up at this gala, um, and as the last speaker, perhaps it's appropriate that it's a non-mathematician. So I'd like to take the next 15 minutes. I'm joking, not the next 15 minutes. I would just like to say, I, I wish I could be there in person with all of you. I wish we could all be together in person to share in the laughter and the camaraderie and the sense of common purpose. Um, I come to it, of course, as a layperson, as a non-mathematician, but it strikes me that if if mathematics really is the language of the universe, that is a language we should all endeavor to be speaking more fluently and with more goodwill. There's plenty of reason for despondency and concern and worry right now. I don't even need to cite an example. But it seems to me that mathematics is one of these towering achievements of human culture that throughout the ages, across place, across time, stands as a beacon of what people can do when they're working together and building on each other's work and giving something to the world where ultimately it converges beauty and truth. It's an honor and a privilege to be in and among you, even at this distance. And so my congratulations to all of you and my heartfelt uh, and sincere appreciation for the ongoing relationship that I and ideas have with the Fields Institute. Um, Doff of the chapeau to all of you. I'd like to thank all of our participants today for your thoughtful and insightful comments. Each of you has added valuable perspectives and paid tribute to the wonderful world of mathematics and the groundbreaking work of Alicia Figali. From the comments of dignitaries and leaders, to the exposition by Francesco Maggi, and to the interview and panel discussion superbly moderated by Hannah Fry, and with input from leading mathematicians, this has been a truly memorable public opening of the Fields Metal Symposium. A key component of today's event is the role of mathematics in bringing people together from around the world. Public lectures like this are special events that present complex mathematical ideas to a general audience that provoke reflection and inspire people to connect across boundaries. And all of this is at the core of the mission of the Fields Institute. The pandemic has opened opportunities for us to connect in ever new ways, and we thank you for connecting with us today. But while I applaud the new opportunity to connect, I would be remiss if I didn't reach out to the millions of people around the world who are suffering greatly as a result of the pandemic. Our hearts and thoughts go out to all of you. Please know that the Fields Institute is doing whatever it can to use mathematics to model and help control the virus. And in partnership with the efforts of many other groups around the world, I know that we will eventually prevail. I would like to thank our many sponsors whose generosity makes it financially possible to hold the Fields Medal Symposium. Thank you to our goal level sponsors, the Great West Life Group of Companies, whose support helped launch the Fields Medal Symposium in 2012. Elsevier Publishing, which joined the symposium in 2016. We also recognize our silver level sponsor, the late James Stewart, whose influence on the world of mathematical education continues. I would like to express appreciation to our bronze level sponsors, Edward Beerstone, George Elliott, John Gardner, Dan Rosen, and Philip Siller. Finally, I would like to thank the Istituto Italiano di Cultura Toronto and the Embassy of Italy, Ottawa, for their kind support. Our special event today was possible only because of the dedicated efforts of the Fields Institute staff who have worked tirelessly to put this program together and I would like to publicly thank them for their efforts. In these times, we are growing our community by fostering the connections we make through our networks. If you like what we are doing, and you believe in what we're capable of doing, I encourage you to share your thoughts and your experience here today through whatever medium you're most comfortable. You can tag Fields Institute on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you again for joining us today and for taking part in the first ever online public opening of the Fields Medal Symposium. We encourage you to stay in touch and to look out for upcoming public events and for our scientific programming, which runs throughout this week. And most importantly, please stay safe and healthy. Until we meet again, keep well, my friends.